Hey everybody, Kirk here. Thanks so much for inviting us into your homes again today. School is out and summer is here, which means we're getting ready to kick off our summer series and classes at North Coast. And we have a super exciting lineup for you this year. Chris is having a conversation about race. Larry is addressing parenting for the long haul. And Christopher is posing the question, is God evil? We're also gonna be offering classes on marriage, finances, spiritual discipline, and so much more. So for more information and to register for certain classes, go to northcoastchurch.com and click on summer series and classes. You know what else is exciting? You have been so busy serving your communities during this pandemic that the video team sent me three Three separate community service videos, each one highlighting a different project. So over the next several weeks, you're gonna get to see exactly what you've been up to during this quarantine. But for now, here's just another example of how you continue to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Hey, this is Connor, your community service pastor. And right now I'm standing outside of Interfaith who's serving hundreds of people every single week. And I wanna take you inside and show you some of the cool projects going on right now and see if you wanna be a part of it. One really great way you could help Interfaith is have your family, have your kids put together sandwiches and put together a little kit. You can make a sandwich, put a cutie in there, put a juice box put a granola bar and we're passing out hundreds of these every single day. So you could drop these off during regular business hours and these would help feed families. Another way you could help is you could assemble one of these toiletry kits. I love that this is one of the, uh, someone who's in the Jordan who put these together. They brought in a bunch and you could tell they put a lot of thought into it. So we're giving these out to people who don't have basic toiletries. You can assemble these, put them in a plastic bag, maybe even put a little note like Zoe did here and drop these off at Interfaith. Right now I'm standing by some of our volunteers from North Coast Church and they are squeezing shampoo and big bottles into little uh, containers that we're gonna put in boxes for people to take with them when they pick up their groceries. You wanna say hi? Hi. <laughs> They're actually here every single week doing this. And so we're looking for more people like them to come here and be a part of it. So if you wanna be a part of what Interfaith is doing right now, it's easy. You can go to northcoastcommunityservice.org. We'll see you there. We want to say a huge thank you to everyone involved and a special thank you to Connor and the community service team who continue to find opportunities for us to serve. Hey, before we get started, I wanted to remind you that the digital bulletin is the best place to get everything you need for weekend service. You can fill out a communication card, take sermon notes, and even donate. You can find that digital bulletin on our homepage or in our North Coast app. But for now, we're going to join the San Marcos Escondido worship pastor, Johnny Mercury, and his team as they lead us in worship. Hope you enjoy. Hey church family, my name is Johnny and I am the worship pastor right here at our San Marcos Escondido campus. We are so glad to be bringing worship to you today through these means. You know, we've all been experiencing the ups and downs and the emotions that the season has brought. And I think along with that, we need to be reminded that we're gonna be facing storms either way in our lives. That's promised in the Bible. And so I think when we're in those times of feeling overwhelmed, those, those times of doubt, it's important to be reminded of, of who our God is and also that our God is with us, just like Jesus was with the disciples on the Sea of Galilee when he calmed the storms. The song that we're bringing to you today, the song of praise, it's not only a declaration of our faith, but it's also a, a needed reminder that we are with God, that he is for us, and that he is our peace and our confidence and our everlasting hope. So let's worship together.
count on nothing left All my hope is in you Always in you Jesus my comfort is And while I'm waiting worship God with this praise everything that we are God all of our gifts and talents Lord all of our fears and doubts we bring them to you and we believe that you can take these things and use them for your goodness God that you can use them for your glory we sing together it's a new horizon
Hey, North Coast, thanks for joining us today. And, uh, and I know there's a lot of you outside of uh, what we call North Coast Church that are watching and you're welcome. But today I say welcome North Coast specifically because uh, this is a message that we really want our church to hear. Uh, this is not gonna be a message that we wanna do for social media or we want the community to know or politically where we stand. This is a message for the church today. And so the rest of you and even North Coast, give this at least four minutes. And once you hear what this is about, if you wanna sign off and find some other great teaching out there, so be it. But I'm gonna tell you straight off the bat, this is the toughest outline I have ever written in 17 years of being a pastor here at North Coast, without a doubt. I sat down and poured my heart into my first outline and realized you can't teach that today. You can't. And I didn't want to deal with the fallout that was going to come from that message. So I wrote a second outline, just avoiding uh, the current situation altogether. And I realized I couldn't call myself a pastor if I taught that message. So I wrote a middle of the road outline. I'm trying to say, how can we keep the peace and yet let the gospel speak? And I tore up that outline as well. And I am just going to sit here and tell you, uh, this is the most scared I have ever been teaching a message to our church in 17 years. And I'm not a fearful guy. My friends and family will tell you, uh, there's a lot of West Texas in this boy and I just don't shy away from a fight. And I'm not a fearful guy, but I know what's happening in our culture today. And I see where this passage lands in our series. And this is one where I'm damned if I do and I'm damned if I don't. And if I get to choose what side I get damned on, well, I'm gonna go back and preach a gospel from a text that even though we started the book of Acts 20 weeks ago, today's passage, 20 weeks after we started this series, not knowing what was gonna happen in the climate of our culture today, we fall on a passage that squarely deals with the biggest race issue in the entire New Testament. And I gotta tell you, North Coast, this would be so much easier if you were a different church. And when you hear that, let me tell you, I am so glad you're not a different type of church. But if this church was all far right in our political views and understanding and echo chamber, I could teach to that crowd. If this church was just middle right, I could teach to that. If this church was just middle of the road, I could teach a middle of the road sermon. If this church was just middle left, I could teach to a middle left group. And if this church was far left, I could teach a message to the far left. But our church isn't. We are D- all of the above. You couldn't get our staff to line up on a political party or issue if you tried. And you know what? We don't try. We all fly under one flag and that is Jesus Christ and his gospel. And underneath that flag, there's a room for a lot of differences when the gospel is held in priority. And so this is gonna be tough because I love the church that we are. And I love that on the spectrum in the last month, we are hearing from here, 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 or here, and we have lined up on one of those political sides, issues, or echo chambers that we resonate with. And so what I'm gonna beg of you, if you're still listening, right now you're on the click button, I get it. What I'm gonna beg of you is listen to this. Let me tell you where the scripture is right now, and then ask you without you being able to vote, what do you expect me to do? We end chapter seven and we're starting chapter eight in the book of Acts. And in the last two weeks, we've seen, we've seen the church at this pent up frustration in a group of people. We've seen there has been months of angst and agony pent up about this church and the little persecution they've been under and watching their apostles be persecuted. So far, it hasn't affected the church, but it's been building up and building up. And then it all culminated last week when there was a public killing of one of their church members and persecution breaks out and Christians are scattered all across different lines. And in the midst of that, you find yourself in a time of Israel where there is no moral and there is no spiritual direction. There's a moral and a spiritual breakdown. There's a lot of religion, just not a lot of the spirit of God amongst people. And this is the climate of Acts chapter seven. And we turn the page and today is Acts chapter eight. And Acts chapter eight clearly takes us in and explodes Jew versus Samaritan, the most, the most hated race issue of the day. And right now, your minds are already going there. Right now, whoa, 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 is this George Floyd? Are we talking about law enforcement? Are we talking about Christian today? Are we talking about the right? Are we talking about, guys, and this is why this is so difficult. If I just taught Bible without any way saying, this is how it applies to us today, you should fire me. If you fire me, some of you would applaud. But you know what? Today, I'm only caring about the applause from nail-scarred hands. And then that is what we're called to do. 
And I know there are some of you right now that just because we've been so polarized on this, we're not gonna be able to hear scripture without putting our politics in front. And, and I get, I get shot at, I get that's my role. But Chris Hilkin did a prayer last week, a simple prayer for love and justice. And people wanted to blow him out of the water for praying in a service about love and justice. How have we gotten there? I'll tell you how we got there. We got there because we haven't gone back and looked at, man, the gospel's got to come screaming into this. You see, as we're going to get into this in just a second, Satan is called the great deceiver. He's called the father of lies, a great liar. And, and what's his job? His job is simply going to do this. His job is going to make us think this is political. No, this is the gospel. Uh, I've entitled this what the world needed then and what the world needs now. And God in his infinite wisdom knew we would be in chapter seven and chapter eight this week in American history. And he would show us, let me show you what the gospel did in Jewish history. Let me show you why you even have the church today because it came out of persecution. Let me tell you Gentile, why you can call yourself a Christian today because it came from a race war that was going on in the nation and the gospel prevailed. And I will not teach that scripture without applying it to where we are today. I can't. And so I beg you, keep the comments down right now. Listen to the end. I beg you, walk through this with me and let's hear this without our political blinders on at this moment. You can put them on at the end of this and then ask yourself and judge me all that you want. But let's try to go back to scripture. And I know that's tough right now. And we told you we took a stand on not opening the church and being uh, compliant to the government because of COVID-19. And, and, and so many of you said that's political. The church has never been political. Why are we political? It's not, it's about obedience. And we're gonna give you an example on when to disobey authorities. That was the only concern of ours as a leadership team. We didn't concern about listening to the left rhetoric or the, or the right wing rhetoric. We weren't concerned about who was saying what or what graphs or how this thing started or who's behind it. All we were concerned about is we are about to lay down an example. We teach obedience every weekend. We are about to give you an example. Here's when you can disobey authority. And if that's what this is about, we are going to show you. We will obey authority, even when it's difficult, even though it goes against what we want, even though it goes against financially what we'd like to do with taking offerings on the weekend. We will obey authority until it disagrees. It makes us disobey the gospel. And we just wanted to lay that down for you. This for us was simply about obedience, not politics. But I know so many of you saw politics involved in that. Today, yes, the passage is going to give us racism. This isn't a political issue. It is a sin issue. And no, the church isn't being political. The church has always stood against sin. And this is why Christian, when right now you're going, oh, I'm not racist. I don't know why we have to talk about this. We have never dealt with any sin like that. We don't look at child abuse and go, I, I don't know why we have to deal with people with child abuse. I, I'm against child abuse. It's not okay to be against it. We have to come against it. We do that with addiction. Why do we have to have addiction groups? Why do we have A groups that meet on the campus? Why do we have to talk about addiction? I'm against addiction. Well, of course you are. But a sin issue, we can't as a church go, well, we're against it. Why do we have to deal with it? No, we have to come against it. No one's gonna see a kid being abused and go, oh, it's not my issue. I'm not a child abuser and I'm against it. This isn't about them. This is only about us. Can you hear this? When I said we're gonna start filming North Coasters just to share their story about race with the rest of the body, you would have thought by the emails I got that I declared we are bringing Satan into our children's ministry and have them teach them a few lessons. Why are we doing that? Why are we caving into the political? Why are we listening to the far left? We are listening to black families in our church that are sheepishly raising their hand going, I don't think people sitting around me know what this is doing to me. We are being 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12 that said, congratulations, if you sign up to be a Christian, you're all part of one body and the body has many parts and colors. And if one part is hurting, we all hurt. If one part is suffering, we all suffer. And it's not good enough to say, no, I'm against that suffering. No, 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 it goes further and says, you carry each other's burdens. You get inside, you understand. We're gonna empathize, not sympathize. Our church can never go, well, I feel bad or feel sad for them. That's not carrying a burden. We're gonna come along and say, let me hear your story. I wanna empathize. I didn't grow up being you. I, I'd like to at least know what it's like to be in your skin because I, I was born with this skin. And we're gonna be 1 Corinthians 12 and we're gonna be Romans 12. And people, that's not political. 
That's the pastors of your church saying, wow, this has boiled up some hurt within our body. <laughs> when I got a, a palm thorn stuck right underneath my big toe, a giant canary palm thorn right through my big toe, all the way up under the nail. The rest of my body didn't go, well, that's not my issue. We're against thorns. Oh, the rest of my body came to a screeching halt until I could figure out how to help that toe out. And, and that's where we're going with this. <laughs> and I wanna show you what the gospel did 2000 years ago so that your soul and my soul can be saved if we're non-Jewish. And I wanna show you the need today for why the gospel has to come into play in our lives. And if at the end of this, you wanna make it about your political agenda right away, just right. I don't know if I'm reading comments this week. I don't know if I can do that to me and my marriage and my kids for another week, not after this message. But if it makes you feel better, right. I'm gonna open the Bible to Acts chapter eight. There's been a death of Stephen. Persecution has broken out. The church has had months of pinked up angst and anger. And now everyone's scrambling to cross different lines and borders. And the Holy Spirit says, North Coast, look at what chapter you're on. Read it. Get this one. <laughs> Acts chapter eight. Verse four. It reads like this. So those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Circle, highlight, underline, asterisk, exclamation point, star, right somewhere in the margin. This is really, really important. So the Christians in the midst of persecution and a race war that's about to break out, shared the gospel wherever they went, whatever they clicked on, whatever they posted, whatever they responded to. They didn't do anything with their hands or with their mouth that the gospel wasn't attached to it. And the Holy Spirit goes, let me just give you the story of, of one of these Christians. So Philip went down to a city in Samaria. Dun, 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 dun. And every good Jewish listener would have understand. Wait, 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 wait. Christians aren't going into Samaria. I mean, Samaritans, they're the worst. Samaritans are worse than the dogs. In John chapter nine, James and John asked Jesus, can we just send fire down on Samaria? I mean, remember talking to Jesus is like prayer, talking to God, this is their prayer. Can we just send fire down on the Samaritans? And Jesus is like, are you serious? Yeah, that's what they're good for, right? These people are people that just need to be burned. Can we send fire down on them? You know what's ironic? It's the very next chapter. It's the very next chapter where Jesus talks about a good Samaritan. In, in Matthew nine, they say, hey, can we call fire down on Samaritans? And the very next chapter, Jesus, let me tell you about how to love your neighbor. You know who the hero of the story is? A Samaritan. I wonder if he looked right at James and John at that point and goes, do you guys get in this yet? They're like, eh, eh. And when Christianity breaks out, it goes to Samaria. One of, the, one of the worst curse words you could call a Jewish person was an S word. And in fact, in John chapter nine, when the religious leaders come against Jesus, there's two things they want to call him. They call him a Samaritan and they call him demon possessed. Those were the two harshest things you can come up with. You're a Samaritan and you're demon possessed. And Jesus didn't even answer the Samaritan. He goes, you think I'm demon possessed? How can I do the work of God? He just left the race car out of that. This is where Christianity goes. As soon as there's persecution in the city, as soon as there's a death, as soon as everything breaks, the Bible could have gone anywhere. Let me tell you about Jews that come to know God. Let me tell you about religious leaders. The very first story is, let me tell you what happens with race because the gospel leaves the temple. The gospel is chased out of the Bible studies. The gospel is chased out of the church. And let me tell you where it goes. It goes to Samaria. I just dropped my glasses. I'm gonna have to hold my Bible down here, see if I can read. I can't read. I'm gonna have to drop camera, get my glasses. Hold on, I'm coming right back. Whew. Are you ready? I'm getting worked up. We good. How far are we into this? Good, we only got two and a half hours. Now, Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed Christ there. And when the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs that he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. Now with shrieks, evil spirits came out of many and many paralytics and cripples were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Now for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great. 
And all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, this man is, circle, highlight, underline, this man is the divine power known as the great power. Are you kidding me? I mean, first century listeners, Jewish audiences have got to be, whoa, whoa, wait, 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 wait. The city's in an uproar. The nation's in turmoil. There's been a public death. Persecution breaks out. And now you're not just playing the race card. You're not just taking me into Samaria. Now it's the sorcerer of Samaria. You can't get any lower for a Jewish person reading or being there. You couldn't get farther from the kingdom of God if you tried at this time. You are going to take the gospel to Samaria and to a sorcerer, and not just any sorcerer, king of sorcerers. He boasted himself great power, and the people in this city knew him as the divine power. You are God. This is getting good. So they followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his magic. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. You get that? What's Philip preaching in this? To Samaritans who are hated. Samaritans, a group of people 600 years before this, they started out as good Jewish people. But when the Assyrians came in and attacked Israel, the Assyrians took all the rich and noble Jews to a captive land. They left lower class Jews. And then they brought a lot of other people that they had captive from their march and they dispersed them in the land. So what happens over 40, 50, 60, 70 years, that's right, the Jews marry non-Jews and they get a mixture of their religion and a mixture of idols, so much so that they set up their own temples, their own sacrifice, their own system. See, this is why Jews hate Samaritans more than any other people group because you have polluted our chosen race. You have polluted our religion. You are of a half-breed. You are a mockery. And when Philip goes down to preach, what does he preach? Two things, the kingdom of God and Jesus Christ. Let me tell you how to be part of the kingdom of God. And let me tell you what Jesus did. Philip doesn't speak against race. He doesn't speak against Samaritans. Philip doesn't set up a six week study on sorcery and where the real power comes from. Philip doesn't teach against the black arts or black magic. He just brings Jesus Christ in his kingdom. And they were all baptized, both men and women. And Simon himself believed and was baptized. And he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles that he saw. Here's a guy that thought, lived, believed completely one direction. And after he came into contact with the kingdom of God and the gospel, he's amazed by what he used to do and be to who he is today. He's amazed by how he used to feel about himself. Because remember, he boasted. This isn't Philip found some poor guy that was down and out and broken and just couldn't find peace in life and he introduced him to Christ. No, this guy was seen as God. This guy was hero status. This guy probably had a lot of money and lucrative dealings with his powers and with what he was doing with the occult and his magic. This guy was one of the most powerful, famous guys in the area. And when he encountered the gospel, he himself was amazed. Oh, I thought I used to have life by the horns, but this... This is incredible. Now, is the guy fully out of the woods? Is his heart fully Christ? Is he fully walking with God? We're about to see there's still a lot of old life in him, but the story gets better. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. And when they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon, remember the ex-sorcerer, when he saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of hands, he offered them money and said, give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. (gasps) You can give power. There's a Holy Spirit that can come upon people. I'll offer you money. Show me how to do this trick. And you can't really blame the guy. That's what his whole life was. Parlor tricks. We're working with demonic spirits, working with magic, making money off of it. I see this new power. Teach me that trick. I can make money off of this. See, this guy just simply saw the power of God for his own personal gain. And the power of God is always for other people, not our own personal gain. And Peter answered him, may your money perish with you. <laughs> you want me to paraphrase that? You and your money can go to hell. <laughs> Chris, I don't think that's what he says. The Phillips translation of the Bible actually has it. You and your money can go to hell. May you and your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry 
because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness, pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see you are full of bitterness and captive sin. Then Simon answered, okay, pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. And when they had testified and proclaimed the word of the Lord, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. Before we jump into some main characters, let me just answer maybe a little bit of confusion. Wait, people were saved and baptized, but they didn't have the spirit of God? Peter and John had to come and give them the spirit of God? So are we not have the spirit and we're saved? Chris, you guys have always taught us that you get the spirit the moment you accept Jesus into your heart, the moment you become a Christian. Again, this is descriptive, not prescriptive. There's only, I think, two places in the Bible you will find something like this. Hey, here's what I believe it is. It could be a couple things. Well, maybe they had the spirit of God, but this was a second, a greater grace and mercy that they needed given from the apostles. Could be. But, but remember back in Matthew, in fact, I think it's Matthew 16, 19. In Matthew 16, 19, Jesus talks to the disciples and he says, I give you the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound. Whatever you loose will be loosened. Now go. Let, let me tell you what I think is happening here. Because race is the pivotal issue of that society. And people wanted to speak about racism and people wanted to make it political. But Philip just brought the gospel in the kingdom of God. And he didn't want to speak against Samaritans and he didn't want to speak against sorcery. He just wanted to bring the gospel and Jesus Christ. And when people encountered Jesus Christ in the gospel, they gave their lives. You know what's going to happen back home? Come on, think about it. What's going to happen to the Jewish church when they find out about Philip's story? Exactly. Those people aren't Christians. Those people aren't part of us. Those, oh, are you, Samar- a Samaritan sorcerer? You're telling me he's allowed to come to church. You're telling me in the midst of Samaritan and sorcery issue, this guy's gonna call himself a Christian right now? Do you know how far in the spectrum he is from where I am today? <laughs> And for there to be a cohesiveness and for the church body to see Christianity is not for your Bible study and your Jewish group, but it's supposed to go out. That was Acts 1, 8. You will be my witnesses in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The gospel is for all people on all issues, on all political parties, because you're not gonna accept this one when it comes to the Samaritans. I'm gonna let my apostles come and the guys that started this who walked with Jesus are gonna lay hands and you're gonna see the spirit of God. This is confirmation more for the church in Israel than it is for the Samaritans, that we are one family, we are one body. And when the Samaritans hurt, you better start hurting. You have to. And no matter where you've gone on this issue, the very first story we have of the gospel in the midst of persecution, the very first story we have of the church taking the gospel outside of its Bible study. So far, we've just seen the church meeting in the temple and in Christian homes in Jerusalem. That's all we've seen in the first seven chapters. And the very first story we have, people say, what about them? And the spirit of God comes out in a second outpouring just to show the church, this is what I want. This is what I want. So is your mind racing right now? Well, who's the characters? So who's playing Stephen today? Where's law enforcement fit in? Are the Sadducees, are we supposed, no, 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 no. Don't draw any lines or parallel. Don't say, Chris, are you saying today, where are we? Are we verse three? No, watch what the gospel did then because that's what our society needs now. And if you need to pinpoint who are the main players in our society today, I want you to write this down. An incredible story that we can't ignore. The main characters, number one is God. And how is God defined? He is a God of love and justice. He's a God of love and justice. That's the main character. Where is God at the time in Israel? He's absent. A lot of religion. There are small pockets of Bible studies holding on to the Holy Spirit, but he's absent from society. Where has God been in our public arena for decades now? We've done a great job of removing God from the public arena. We've taken out the source of love and justice. Ironically, what is our nation crying out for today? Love and justice. Church, hear me. You cannot bring love and justice to the world without the source. At best, you can bring policies and procedures to be followed. 
but that's just gonna tie up angst. That's just gonna tie up old bitterness. That's just gonna hide hatred or racism. You cannot have love and justice without the source. And Israel removed the source. God was not active and prevalent in Israel at that time. Who's the other character? Satan, how's he defined? Let's let Jesus define him. In John 10, 10, he goes, he's a thief. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Kill, steal, and destroy. And in John chapter eight, Jesus says he's the great liar. He's the great deceiver. So that's what we're gonna say about Satan. He steals, kills, destroys, and he's the great deceiver. What happens in Israel? In the absence of God, when persecution breaks out, there's killing, there's stealing, there's destroying. And there's an incredible amount of lies about what Christianity is and what it isn't. Where are we today in our society? We take God out of a society and there's only two characters in our story. It's backfilled with another power, another source, much where, where the sorcerer found his. And we've got an enemy that loves to kill. And what happens? Well, we love to glorify stealing and destroying. We wanna take selfies in front of buildings that are on fire. Looting is celebrated and cheered. And what's the aftermath? A great liar, a great deceiver that's trying to tell the church it's politics. Stay out of politics. This is about sin. And this is about the role the church has to play. This is how the church broke out in history then. This is how God moved then. This is how God has to move now. Now let me make this really, really clear. Write it down. People are never the enemy but we can all be influenced by him. People are never the enemy. Don't look at a different party. Don't look at a different platform and don't look like people that got caught up in looting or in stealing or in killing and say, that's the enemy. People will never, ever, ever be our enemy. They will just be under the influence of the enemy. And we all have. I've been under Satan's influence so many times in my life. Go ahead right now. Just raise your hand if you've never been influenced by Satan. Okay, I don't see a single hand. So that kind of does it, unanimous. Every time we treat our spouse the way that we want to treat instead of the way God asks us to treat his son or daughter, I'm influenced by the enemy. Every time I lash out against my kids and I react instead of respond, I'm influenced by the enemy. What I do or don't do with our government or employees or, employee or employers or my neighbor or my enemy, I have a tendency to be influenced by the enemy constantly, especially if there's an absence of the spirit because the spirit's going to bring love and justice. In that absence, there's a death, there's stealing, there's destroying, and there's great lies of who's at fault and who's to blame and what we do. And there, everywhere the Christians went, they brought the gospel. So right now, if you're trying to figure out in chapter seven and eight, who plays what part, where can we label? There's only two characters, God and Satan. And don't line up any people or person under that without putting yourself there first and go, okay, now I see why we need the gospel because we all start in the enemy's camp. And here's why this is so important. Number two, if we fail to recognize and define the enemy, we will lose the battle every time. If we fail to recognize and if we fail to define who the enemy is, we're gonna lose this battle. If our enemy is another group, another person, another platform, another party, we have lost this battle. And, and right now, I already know it because I already know that those of you, and I can see the names right now. What about truth? God's got the truth. It's about truth. I'm just speaking. Yes, yes, yes. God's the God of truth and truth will always fall under either love or justice. And we're about to see in a second, just as Philip did, how we handle truth in this society. But if we lose sight of who the enemy is, we're going to lose this battle because we're going to destroy our reputation before our truth can ever be shared, ever. And so, so as we jump into this, right now, how the church became the church. How do we do this? Number one, this persecution made them go where they otherwise never would have gone. Do you get that? Persecution made the church go where they otherwise never would have gone. The church would have never gone to Samaria ever. You don't set foot through Samaria. Samaria is the central region in Israel. For the Galileans to go up to the temple, they walked around the long road, the Jordan road, the river road, all the way to get to the temple. No one even walked through that land. Jesus is the only rabbi we know of that ever walked through Samaritan because he had to speak to them. He had to teach the woman at the well. No one else would dare do it. Persecution made the church hit the e-break on their church Bible studies and and their groups and say, what about them? I don't get that. 
I, I don't get where they're coming from. I don't get their angst. I don't get their anger or I don't get their hurt. Persecution made the church stop and say there are splinters in the body that we got to look at. And I don't want to fall under a rhetoric of how it got there or how long it got there. We have phrases we can't even use today because we're all using different dictionaries. So many of my pastor friends in the last two weeks I've talked to said, Chris, I don't think I can preach. I can't speak on this issue. I don't have enough knowledge and I don't have enough political. I don't have enough. I can't speak on this without being tarred and feathered. And I go, I get it. I get it. And yet you look at what the early church did and the early church says, I'm just going to go there. I'm not going to send them letters. I'm going to walk beside them. I'm going to walk where Samaritans walk. In fact, I'm going to hang out with the sorcerer and his group. And I'm going to share the kingdom of God. And I'm going to share the story of Jesus in my life. You see, their actions and attitudes were the bridge that truth traveled over. Their actions and attitudes were the bridge that truth traveled over. It's constant, isn't it? All throughout this passage, the crowd saw what Philip was doing. The, the crowd was amazed by what Philip was doing. His actions and attitudes won him the right to speak the gospel and the kingdom of God. And this is where truth comes in. Truth follows once they know our actions and our attitudes. If they don't know our actions and our attitudes, truth will never be heard. We have just become them, them. And it was done with love. Where do you get that example? Jesus. <laughs> A Jesus that constantly walked with love. A Jesus that constantly walked doing miracles. A Jesus that constantly walked and healed, sat, listened, wept with those who needed to be wept with. Some of us right now, if we don't understand this issue, we just need to weep with those of, you, those of us in our church that are weeping. And that's why we're gonna film stories. That's why I want you just to listen to North Coasters. I want you to understand where they have wept. It's not good to say, well, I'm not, I'm not racist and I didn't teach my kids to be racist. I want to weep with those who have a different pigmentation than I have. I want to empathize and go, I've never really gotten that before. I didn't know that splinter was in our church. I want to hear this. And Philip's actions and attitude, those are the bridge that then truth can travel over. We have so many Christians right now that want to respond, but it's not responding with the gospel. You're just lashing out truth and this truth isn't being heard. Just giving truth is not the gospel, folks. Jesus never came and just preached. His actions brought the crowds. His actions had people lining up outside his door. And then he shared the kingdom of God and salvation. And oh yeah, at times he rebuked those that he walked with. And he would rebuke those that were so, so stubborn that they couldn't hear that came to him and were in front of him. And, and there's a place for that. And we watch how persecution broke out in the early church and I realize this is how it's gotta be done. It's why our actions and attitudes and how we're gonna obey our government at this time stems from Daniel chapter one where Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego spoke out against the Babylonian government, spoke out and said, we don't agree with what we're doing. We feel like what you're asking us to do goes against our faith. Can you please try us? Can you please just let us? Can you please just give us this? And they did it in such a way that at the end of Daniel chapter one, their own local government that they were against applauded them and said, we've never seen leadership like this. We've never seen anyone quite like you. And their government, anti-Jewish government, raised these Jewish men up to leadership level. This hasn't been easy for us North Coast, but I tell you, in the way we've done this, we've received so much praise from our local government, from councils, from city governments that we're not even a part of, saying thank you, thank you. One of the hardest things for a believer right now in government is the opposition I get from the church. It's so good to get a church that speaks out into this issue. We don't get it. Here's what we'd like to see. Here's our timeline, but we're gonna obey you guys and we're gonna love you in the way we do it. Thank you, North Coast, for the reputation you've had in just the last couple months of what that looks like. This is earning us the right to speak truth. This is earning us the right for people to call up and go, so what is your stance on this? What does North Coast think on that? You see, the church up to this point was simply a Bible study. It wasn't a world changer. Little did they know that what the world needed was the gospel in the world. And in the midst of persecution, attitudes, actions, love, and truth 
went where it would never have gone if there wasn't persecution. Oh, that's our hope. And that's our prayer for the church today. So how do we do this? How do we take this home? I'm sure you can fill in this next blank because we've already done it. The gospel was shared wherever Christians went. And that's easy to say. Well, you just got to share the gospel wherever you go. Yep, got it down, good. And then don't put your pens, pencils, your Bible away. Don't start turning this off and going to whatever you're doing this weekend. What in the world does that mean? Well, part two is next week. (laughs) Part two, we're going to watch Philip and what he does with an Ethiopian eunuch. Are you kidding me? Okay, listen. I can't make this stuff up. (laughs) I can't make this stuff up. We've got a Samaritan sorcerer and now an Ethiopian eunuch. And the Holy Spirit's saying, this is where the gospel goes. This is where the gospel is going to go, church. If you're going to be part of what the gospel is about, this is where it goes. So I just started jotting down for us. Homework until part two next week. How do we come alongside people? Here's what I wrote down. What's it mean to share the good news? What was the gospel? It was incarnational. It's a big churchy word. What's it mean? It means God came to earth. God became flesh. What's it mean for us to bring the gospel? Well, it means we need to go to places that we haven't been before. We need to go to places that are unlike us. That's the gospel that God so loved that he sent his son. What happened in the church 2000 years ago? What did the gospel do? The gospel went to people of a different race and a different issue and a different culture and a different political and a different religion. That's where the gospel went. We became incarnational. We walked where we otherwise wouldn't have walked. We come alongside people we otherwise wouldn't have come alongside. And it was a response out of love, not anger, not wrath. For God so loved that he gave. God didn't send Jesus. For God so hated us and wanted to burn us. He sent his son to set us straight. It's a response out of love. So whatever you walk into, whatever your Facebook, whatever your Instagram, whatever you are tweeting, whatever you're responding to, whatever you're listening to, walk alongside another group, another person. Walk alongside and try to empathize, not just sympathize. And your response is going to be out of love. How can I lovingly enter this dialogue? How can I lovingly post this? How can I lovingly come alongside? And then it was the act of greatest grace and mercy we've ever seen. The fact that Jesus came to earth was the act of greatest grace and mercy. We destroyed death. I was under the enemy's influence. And instead, Jesus died for that. Gives me grace. What is grace? Getting what I couldn't possibly earn on my own. Grace. What is mercy? Not getting what I deserve. How do you share the gospel at a time like this? In every conversation, in every social media interaction, you give grace on an ordinary amount of love, support, patience, and peace to someone who probably doesn't deserve it. That's fine. And you give mercy. You don't give people what they deserve. When you are doing that, you know you're bringing the gospel into every situation. What does it mean? Restraint every step of the way. I have never been able to get to the end of the gospel without picturing a God in heaven, biting his lip. I know that's an anthropomorphism. I know God doesn't have a lip. I know he's a being divine, but this is how I think. That every step of the way, God had to watch his son be abused, ridiculed, called the S word, called demonic, beaten, whipped, mocked, and at any moment, God with a thought could have rectified the whole situation, could have wiped everybody out and made his son whole again. Took away the blood, took away the scars, and there is restraint every step of the way of not lashing out and not reacting, but simply responding because this is about love, grace, and mercy. This is about love, grace, and mercy. And that means it's got to be done in restraint. You want to know how to share the gospel and bring the gospel into everything we do? You are going to have to learn a lot of restraint. And guess what? You don't have it. And that's why you need the gospel. The spirit will give us grace, mercy, and restraint. And you better understand this means I'm going to be sacrificed. You cannot bring the gospel without understanding. It's about sacrifice and serving others, not getting my own way, not getting my own point. Jesus laid down his life and his rights for us. And he himself said, I come to serve, not to be served. I haven't come to get my way. I haven't come to win this. I've come to win you over with my actions and attitude. Then you're going to hear my truth. And then you're going to follow me. And I'm going to lay my life down to do it. And lastly, the entire purpose was to open the kingdom of God and then advance it. You want to know how to bring the gospel in? You want to know how Christian shares the gospel at this time? Well, there you go. (laughs) 
I'm going to go into every situation out of love. I'm going to walk alongside those that I probably haven't walked alongside before. I'm going to give grace and mercy the way God has given me grace and mercy. I'm going to show restraint the way God has shown restraint. Every step of the way, I'm going to serve people. It's not about me being served or heard. And I'm going to do this in hopes that somebody somewhere sees my love, life, actions, and then can hear my truth and come into the kingdom of God. Because let me promise you, not a single Democrat will be in heaven. And not a single Republican will be in heaven there will only be Christ followers. That's it. And that's what we're trying to make in this season. That's what the world needed then. It's what the world needs now. C.S. Lewis said, God cannot give us peace apart from himself because it is not there. There is no such thing, peace apart from God. Our world is crying out, for love and justice. And we, church, are the beholders of the source of love and justice. May we not stay silent. May we not say, well, I'm against it. I guess it's done. May we not say I'm against it, but may we come against it by walking alongside, being incarnational, giving grace and mercy, not giving people what we think they deserve, holding back in restraint, giving people above and beyond what they could ever hope for and deserve and responding in love. Then and only then will you know, we've just done Acts chapter seven and eight. And my bet is you'll turn the page and you will encounter an Ethiopian eunuch and go, what the heck? What am I supposed to do this guy? <laughs> He's not either male nor female. Oh, has that just opened up a whole nother issue in our society today? <laughs> well, that's page two. And guess who gets to speak on that next week? If I'm still here, I love you guys. And I will not let the gospel speak to an event 2,000 years ago without allowing it to speak into our lives today. This is how we share love. This isn't political. There's splinters in our body. Some of us have been blind to them. Some of us have just said, well, I'm getting splinters. Not an issue. And, 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 and we're going to take the next few weeks and not look at what the world thinks. I want to know what North Coasters think and where is that hurt and pain? And how do we walk alongside? And how do we share the gospel? So that one day we can sit in heaven and go, oh my gosh, look who's here. It's the sorcerer from Samaritan. How'd you get here? Yeah, I met one of your guys, Philip. Apparently he was in your life group. And then the life group splintered. And he walked alongside me. And I thought I had it all together. But man, did he show me something I was missing. Father, may we be a church that looks like the church. May we look like a church that has many different political parties, many different political points of view. But a church that understands we are one body and we will hurt where there's hurt. And we will bring your love and your justice and your mercy. May you show us what that looks like today. May you let us be against sin at any cost and any of its victims. And may you drill into our heart. People will never, ever be our enemies. But they are all worth fighting for. All worth fighting for. And we will fight like you fought for us with grace, mercy, love, justice, intentionality, and an amazing amount of restraint given by you, the source of all of those. And may you bless us in the weeks, months, and years to come. May you bless our nation so we can look back at this chapter and say, that's when racism was dealt with. And it is no more because your gospel prevailed. To that end, to that means we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Well, as always, we would love to connect with you online. And one of the best ways to do that is with the communication card through our digital bulletin. Whether you've got a question, a comment, or a prayer request, we would love to hear from you and we'd love to be praying for you. We hope that you were challenged and encouraged by today's message and we'll see you next time.